So here's, here's my agenda. So, so I usually start my presentations with an apology. Today's uh, no different. I do the worst slides in the world. <coughs> um, the good news is that Andrew does fantastic slides, so it's not going to be unremittingly grim. Uh, my, my, my excuse is usually I've, I was too busy, I left it too late. Uh, the reality is I don't have a single design bone in my uh, body. Um, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about a short history of time, my time. <coughs> um, I don't really like talking about myself, though everyone would claim that's not true. The reason I'm going to do that is um, we operate a practice model at Data Art. Um, so only for the last few years, it wasn't always like that. Um, and inevitably, a practice um, is somewhat shaped by its leader. Now, data art is all about um, collaboration and consensus and teams and all the things I like. But the reality is that the experience of the leader shapes the sorts of projects and engagements and clients that you work with. So I thought I would explain my background and then you can sort of see which way it might be going. Um, I'm going to talk about industry issues in financial services as well. Um, why do they need firms like Data Art working for them? Um, I want to talk about our actual experience in financial services, <coughs> and then and then why do people work for Data Art? So this is me. Um, so here's the things I do. I strategy, business strategy. I have quite a lot of experience of running businesses. Um, operational improvement, and I'll tell you a little bit about my career in, in a second. Um, but I come from an operational improvement background, so I view every engagement um, as how much can we improve the operations of our client by improving their IT rather than how much can we improve their IT. Uh, I always look at uh, our engagements in a holistic way. And the byproduct of that is that our engagements are increasingly holistic as a result. So we tend to actually be dealing with overall business change, uh, uh, even people change, as well as operational change. Uh, we have a strong and keen interest in the business outcomes of our clients. And business outcomes, you know, increased profits, increased revenue, access to new markets. Uh, we, just, we don't just turn up and do the IT. I suspect data art never did that, but we certainly don't do that now. Um, program management, I, you know, my, you'll see in a minute, my, I did a lot of project and program management in my life and that kind of shapes the way I behave for good and bad. <coughs> um, business change and transformation, uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat obsessed with changing businesses. I have a bit of a background in rescuing failing businesses um, and uh, I, I like it. It's as simple as that. Um, the one thing that's missing from that slide is people. So if I did my slides properly, my real interest is people. So actually, uh, business processes, IT, everything else, it, none of it works without people. So my, my career was, um, and I said I did a presentation yesterday that was internal. I said, look, I realize that I'm a senior manager, uh, a partner, <coughs> uh, in a room full of engineers. And you probably just think I'm a professional manager. So I'm going to try and gain some credibility among you engineers by telling you that I used to be an engineer. Now, unfortunately, I never used to be a software engineer, not really. Uh, so my, my, uh, my background was I was originally a chemical engineer. Um, and then I got into industrial engineering almost by accident. <coughs> and uh, it's sort of how I ended up here. Industrial engineering is re-engineering all of the business processes of manufacturing, engineering companies, process companies like gas and oil extraction, that sort of thing. Um, I am old enough to have been the guy in the 1980s who was looking at business processes and uh, which were mainly manual and thinking these could be automated using PCs. I know it's hard to believe, but um, Back in the day, we, we, even though we had computers in business, they, w they weren't used properly. Um, it was like cavemen being given knives and forks and then w with them wearing them around their necks and not using them properly. So we ha they, had, they had IT in, in firms, but it was mainly used for storage. It wasn't used for business processing. So I used to look at these manual paper-based business processes or you know manual mechanical business processes and think we could automate that. We could put that onto 
computers. We had the early PCs, we had uh, the early spreadsheets, and I took all of our, in one factory, I took all of our production planning off paper and off the walls, and I stick it, stuck it onto PCs, made it 10 times better. Um, and that's kind of driven my, my whole career, really. Because what happened was, m almost by accident, I got headhunted into financial services, and that would have been in 1989. Um, and I went into financial services, and um, it was incredibly, I, I, I am that old, it was incredibly manually uh, based, um, paper based, and, and also they had no processes for, uh, they had no uh, tools and techniques for improving their business processes, so not only were they paper based, but they were very, very inefficient as to how they did their work. There was lots of duplication, there was lots of redundancy, P paper was being passed here, there and everywhere. Um, you know, customers for banks and for life insurance companies would fill in forms. Um, they would send this form to an insurance company. It would be part processed by their local office who would send it to a regional office who would part process it, having checked it and counted it and, you know, recorded it. And then they would send that into um, head office who would receive it, count it, check it, record it and do like one thing on it. They would then send it back to their regional office who would count it, check it, record it, and then it would go to the local office and eventually it would make its way back to the customer who would realize there was an error in it. So I started off in financial services actually saying, why don't we just automate this whole thing? And of course, we didn't have the internet, so the client couldn't go online to do it, but you know, we could actually get the forms, scan them in, capture the data, get the whole thing checked automatically, get it processed very quickly and get it out. Um, so those were great days, really. Um, of course, what happens if you're any good at doing that sort of thing is people say, can you implement it? So, but, you know, but I ended up running projects and programs. Now, what happened to me was some, I, I started running very, very big projects and programs. And this might this might not mean anything to you in in, in Ukraine, but um, <coughs> the Lloyd's of London is the most famous insurance marketplace in the world, and I ended up running the rescue of Lloyd's of London. It was technically insolvent. I had to re-engineer all the business processes. I had to create all new IT from the ground up. I actually had to build a new building from the ground up, and I had to hire 400 staff and create a whole new insurance company. So I ended up running very major programs. Um, I also did the automation of trading at Life, which is the financial futures and options exchange. Um, I don't know how much you know about exchanges, but they were mainly open outcry. Well, they were entirely open outcry, of course, at one point, which is all the traders standing in a trading pit, shouting at each other and gesticulating and trading that way, <coughs> which was um, relatively successful and effective. Um, but the banks that were using the traders were starting to realize that they could do a lot more if trading was automated. Because if you think about it, as a bank, you have great difficulty interacting with my, tra I'm a bank, this is my trader. My trader's picking up information in a trading pit, but she can't easily relay it to me because I'm sat in a building two miles away and I can't easily relay information to her. And they realized that if trading went onto screens, then their ability to see price changes and act on them immediately, manually, uh, would be much enhanced. But of course, they didn't have to act manually because if it was screen-based, they could act on it in an automated fashion, which is where we are today. So I was running those kind of programs, but then, you know, what happens is you, you do a few of those and then you ask, you're asked to be a director. So I ended up um, in the late 1990s becoming a board director. I've been chief operating officer of uh, three companies, a private equity company, an exchange technology company, and a market data company. <coughs> and, and I always had responsibility for uh, IT as part of that. And, and I also um, sometimes also filled the CIO and CTO role at the same time as I was COO. So that's my background. Let me th just tell you a little bit about some of the projects. I've mentioned them. And, and this does kind of inform what does the data art finance practice do now? It's because um, if nothing else, I'm not claiming I'm some kind of genius because I did these, because I'm not. Um, but the scale of these and the importance in terms of their business outcomes to the financial market in the UK and the US and to those companies 
<coughs> is where we are now with data art. So at data art, these are the sorts of clients we have and the sorts of projects and programs we do. So I, I did a reorganization of Norwich Union, which was one of our biggest, or perhaps our biggest life insurer at that time. It's now called Aviva. I created a new private equity company. Um, I created a new mortgage company. Um, I was very, very proud of the fact that from nothing, I built that mortgage company in nine months until I met Andrew, who told me he built a bank in six months from scratch. And building a bank's harder than, an, uh, than a mortgage company. Uh, automation of trading at life. I'll leave the CMA one for a reason. Algorithmic trading. Um, so algor this algorithmic trading is the thing I was sort of alluding to earlier, which is the ability to act on price changes in the market in an automated fashion. If I'd written that properly, I would have put um, automated arbitrage algorithmic trading. So arbitrage, some of you probably know it, arbitrage inside out and upside down, so apologies. But arbitrage is where the movement on one exchange means that the prices on another exchange are momentarily wrong. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, and, and please ask, if, you know, if I say something you really don't understand and you want to understand, just stop me and I, I will try and explain it better. Um, if you think of a stock market, so in the UK our main stock market is the London Stock Exchange. So it's equities. It's, it's the value of the shares in companies. It's as simple as that. We also have a futures market, which was the one at Life that I automated. Now that's owned by Euronext now. The futures market takes a view as to what the price of that equity will be one year from now and five years from now. It's actually the movement in the futures market, the change in the price as to what the one year and five year view is, that moves today's stock price. So it's not the other way around. It isn't the stock price moves and the futures price moves because you know this company's doing better or worse. It's the other way around. As soon as the market thinks this company's going to do better or worse in five years than it thought five minutes ago, then the equity price moves. When both markets are automated, which they both were round about 1998, and I know that because I automated one of those markets, there was a mispricing between the two and banks were able to jump in to the gap in the middle and exploit the mispricing. So they would buy or sell the stock knowing that this, the stock price was about to move because the futures price had moved. And cunning people working in financial services hired me to build that system. So having automated one of the exchanges, I then I was the poacher and the gamekeeper, as we say in the UK, and I then built the, the algo trading to exploit the mispricing. Um, uh, and if, in case you're wondering, it is legal. I was allowed to do it. Um, the Rescue of Lloyds of London I've mentioned. That was a huge program. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a company called Market. Market is an extremely successful market data company. I mean, it's one of the world's leading market data companies now. It provides prices to anyone involved in financial and commodity markets, uh, and actually much broader than that as well now. And I was one of the original team that uh, built and grew that company. Elysian Systems, exchange technology company, um, <coughs> fantastic software for business reasons and needed a bit of a transformation, so, so I did that. The one I missed out was transforming CMA. CMA is credit market analysis. And CMA, the reason why that's important is that's how I met data art. So this is what I do now. I'm the global head of the finance practice at data art. To put that in some kind of context, at the moment there is between four or five hundred people in data art working on finance projects, out of a total of about two thousand people. Um, but the finance practice business is on target to double this year compared to last year, and last year was a successful year. So we're we're struggling to recruit enough good people to do all the new business we're getting. Um, <coughs> I, during my career, and, and I, I, I wasn't standing here boasting about my career because this is the relevant point. During my career, I had inherited the services of an outsourced software development company. And I think instinctively, I probably would never have done it if it was down to me because I suffered from all of those prejudices and beliefs that are completely wrong uh, that I still encounter in other people. Um, so. I always thought that to build systems, well, first of all, they all had to work for me, number one. 
number two, they all had to sit together and they had to sit next to me. Um, but of course, I've discovered over the last 25 years that that is definitely untrue. So I inherited the services of a si outsourced systems development company. My first one was in India. I love India. It's a great country. The people are extremely optimistic. Um, there are some challenges with using Indian outsource firms, though, uh, which are mainly cultural. Uh, but I do like the country. <coughs> but I confess that uh, over the recent years, certainly since about 2000, uh, all of the outsource firms I've used, pretty much for development at least, <coughs> have been in Eastern Europe and Russia. So I was a fan. And, and also, I don't like doing transactions. I like partnerships. Um, so I'm not going to hire an outsource firm to do one project for me ever, because that's very, very inefficient. If you hire someone to do one project, even if you do it well, they learn lots about your business because they have to, uh, and then they go and you've lost your investment in them. So I'm not interested in doing that. When I sign someone up to be my outsource supplier, I sign them up forever. I've got no intention of letting them go. <coughs> um, and it's worked extremely well for me uh, in London and, and in the US and in New York. Um, when I was running um, CMA, credit market analysis, the underlying technology was very complex and it was innovative at that time. It's slightly commoditized now and it was parsing technology. So again, I'm going to talk jargon and uh, you know, f forgive me if this means nothing and then forgive me if you know all this better than I do and I'm just patronizing you. Um, but we were pumping out uh, millions of prices to the desktops of um, traders. And the way we were doing that was a typical trader trading, we would, we would doing CDS prices, credit default swaps. A typical trader will will at that time was receiving 10,000 emails a day from their brokers. So they're not spam, they are their brokers who are supposed to be giving them prices. They were getting 10,000 emails a day with an average of nine prices in each. Nobody can read 10,000 emails, not even Dimitri. Um, but he can write 10,000 emails, he just can't read them. Uh, I know that. Um, Nobody can use that information, but it's information which to them is critical. So a chap called Forbes Elworthy, around about 1999, uh, with some help from some very clever people, uh, Marek Chovanec uh, being one of them, had developed parsing technology. So what the traders did was they rerouted their, their messaging flow to our technology, which then stripped out all the prices and then represented them on the desktop of the trader and via APIs, et cetera, Excel add-ins into other tools and so on, in a way that they could use it. So a trader could create a, uh, a watch list, because th a trader is only interested in a subset of the market, and they want to know the best price, the last price, and the worst price. So this was, for, but the underlying science of parsing, especially at that frequency, is very complex. <coughs> and. Um, we found it very hard to hire people to support that kind of application. So I thought, well, why, sh why, sh why bother? We should just hire an Eastern European firm uh, to do it for us because the standard of education in the form s former Soviet Union, if I can use that phrase, you don't mind, uh, the standard of education was very high and actually remains very high. And that's quite interesting how that's continued. So the typical um, Eastern European 16-year-old student at school will have done five times more computing than the equivalent American student and will have done three times more maths. And that's a phenomenal difference, five times and three times. <coughs> also, and, and you know, you don't need me to tell you this, the standards are quite high as well. So, like, you know, you can get away with not being very good at anything in the UK. Sorry, Karen. I, I, I had a report from a Romanian firm. They forwarded it to me. I could always find it again because I'm still in touch with the guy who sent it to me originally. Uh, there was some big survey done. It's quite, it's, it's, it's mind blowing, isn't it? You think it can't possibly be true. But then I looked at the report, they published their methodology and you think it really is true. Um, but do you know what? It's kind of a reflection. Of if, if, you, if you were ever to go to school in the UK, you don't do any IT. Forgive me, my home country. You know, you really do very, very little IT, and uh, we don't do much maths either. So it's not that you do phenomenal amounts. We don't do anywhere near enough. Um, though there is a big push in the British education system for us to get back to doing 
stuff that will produce engineers. We, we completely lost our way on that one. Um, so, I, um, so I was looking for another uh, Eastern European firm uh, and my CTO had previously inherited the services of data art. And he said, um, I thought they were really good. And he said something very telling. He said, I don't think they liked me, but I still recommend them. And I thought, well, if you think they don't like you and you're still recommending them, they must be good. So I, hi I hired data art and, and, and they were good, um, uh, uh, extremely good. <coughs> and it was a partnership. Uh, so, you know, you now own, so this is the important thing. Uh, if any, if any of you were ever thinking of joining data art, so here's the thing with the finance practice now, not interested in body shopping, not interested in the client telling our staff what to do, because it's not very interesting for our staff to be in that relationship. What I do when I use an outsource firm is I say, here's my problem or here's my product or solution or service. It's now yours. I'm not going to tell you what my requirements are. Not always. You're going to tell me. You're going to own the roadmap. That's why I hired you. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it, it works very well. Um, so uh, so I, I, I was a client of Data Art for three years. I turned around CMA because though they were market dominant, they had actually lost their way as a business, starting to lose money, and I was hired to turn them around, which I did. I had to change everything. Um, the organization, their own technology, their own business processes, their own staffing. But it worked, and, and Data Art were part of that success. So I then got it bought by McGraw-Hill um, in America, and the business effectively moved to the U.S., or the management of the business moved to the U.S. I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to. <coughs> um, and I became an advisor uh, to Data Art. They asked me to advise them, which I enjoyed doing. I also advised some other firms. And then after three years, we thought we would end our uh, engagement and, and actually get married. So on January the 1st, uh, I became the head of the finance practice, and uh, here we are, properly married. So, so that that so the whole point of that story is 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 to put in context the f the sorts of projects and programs we do now. You know, so uh, typically uh, we typically we are not selling or getting approached by dev team leaders, um, or even dev managers. Uh, the most common person to approach the finance practice now for our services will be either the COO or the CEO, and we go from there. Uh, so who do we work for? Uh, I have a slide later with some logos on it. I might as well not have that in the presentation. Simple reason that the most important people we work for don't like us to publicize that we work for them. Um, I'm not entirely sure that that's uh, a good thing for them. I don't see they benefit that much from that, but there you go. So we work for exchanges. We work for banks, uh, investment banks and retail banks. Uh, we work for quite a few fintech firms, of course we enjoy because we are, you know, quite agile and innovative and like doing creative stuff and uh, so do they. Um, we work for hedge funds, asset managers, investment management and advisory firms. We work for wealth management companies. Uh, we work for insurance companies, market data companies like the one I was running. Uh, we work for brokers, including inter-dealer brokers, uh, the big global inter-dealer brokers. Uh, we work for s relatively small trading firms and um, as well as traders in, in other institutions, uh, including banks, though there's very little proprietary trading in banks in the West. Around the rest of the world, there's a lot of trading still done, and we work for ratings agencies. Um, so what are the industry issues in finance? So why, why, why would anyone use us? Um, banks have a big issue with customer satisfaction, customer loyalty, and customer retention. So uh, two reasons for that. The financial crash means that uh, confidence in banks has dropped a lot. Um, and also the rise of fintech firms. So the uberization of banking. What's happening in banking is that fintech firms now do typically one piece of what a bank does. And they do it in a way that is convenient to you and I. Okay? And they do it at a price that is much cheaper than a bank. Uh, so, you know, if uh, payments, PayPal would be, you know, one of the original fintech firms, but there are now thousands of them and they're all doing a little bit. So they're doing retail loans, they're doing retail uh, investment, they're doing wealth management, they're doing crowdfunding, they're doing microfinancing, they're doing remittances. 
Um, and these firms are not little distractions off to the side. These firms are a serious threat to banking. Banks will always be with us. They are the cornerstone of our economy. Um, but I'll give you an example of how, how disruptive fintech firms can be. If Facebook was to roll out from the US what it does there in terms of the ability to transfer money from uh, one Facebook user to another for free, if they were to roll that out worldwide, then firms like Western Union and MoneyGram would pretty much go bust overnight because for migrant workers around the world, transferring money home can cost them a minimum of 7% of the money and a maximum of 28% of the money. When you can do it on Facebook for free, it's gone. But it's not just Facebook. You know, there, For every single thing that we do in financial services, there is now a fintech firm doing it. And the service is fantastic It's uh, because it's app-based. Banks typically gave us what we wanted the way they wanted to give it to us. We didn't get, a we didn't get to choose. It wasn't a democracy. So they said, I'm going to give you a home loan, but I'm not going to give you a home loan because you've got a proper job and he's self-employed. They were in charge, okay? And then they said, but you have to come into our branch. We have to interview you. You have to have been working in a full-time job for seven years. We have to see all of your bank statements. We have to see you know, all of your pay slips. We have to see this. We have to see that. They were completely in charge. Now the fintech firms are saying, that's all nonsense. It's all about power and control. There's actually no benefit to the customers, and it doesn't reduce default rates or, or, any, or fraud at all. There's no evidence that any of those processes actually help. We're just going to give you what you want in the easiest possible manner for you. So fintech firms look at financial processes from the standpoint of the customer, not from the standpoint of the supplier of the bank. And that is the, that's the biggest breakthrough of all. And then the price of what they charge for some things is, is a fraction of what you can pay. If you think about what you pay for loans, you think what you pay the interest rate, um, if you're, uh, but then you're paying all sorts of fees. You'll tend to find those fees don't exist. Um, banks try and, and try uh, and make their products look competitive. So um, savings products, what we would call unit trusts in the UK, which are buying sh shares of funds or shares of equity. They may say that there's zero percent charges, but the reality is the bid offer spread. The price that they buy it for and the price they sell it to you into your investment product are very, very different prices. There is enormous gap. And the fintech firms just narrow the gap and they're cheaper. So you're getting better value for money. Um, data management in banks is a major issue. Um, <sighs> it's, 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 it's unfair to say banks have lost control of their data because in reality, banks never had control of their data. And it's a bit of a legacy, and it's not just down to IT legacy. Banks were organized in a way where they were very f either functionally divided, so different departments doing different things, and then they had different business units. So there was a business unit for FX, there was a business unit for retail loans, but then they would split that up, retail loans to England, retail loans of this size, of that size, secured and unsecured. Everything was chopped up. Every single little atom of their organization own their own data. Usually didn't manage it properly because you know we've got better at data management in the world generally. And back in the 1990s, early 2000s, we weren't very good at it. Uh, and so now you've got these huge organizations, and I'm not saying JP Morgan is bad at data management, but I'll give you an example of JP Morgan as the size of a bank. JP Morgan employs 307,000 employees. And it's chopped up, like all of these banks, into lots and lots of business units who own their own data, but don't manage their data well. Um, and golden copies, forget about it, because even when they create golden copies, everyone still has a local copy. They've tried the data warehouse solution, which almost never works. They are not really alive to reference data. Uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, I managed to forget the phrase. Um, Federated data models. I always reckon, I, when people say to me, Cliff, can you build a, a data warehouse for my bank? I, I, I always go, well, I could do, but is it the right solution for you? Data warehouse projects are absolutely notorious in financial services for just making a bad situation even worse. They make the banks very, very inflexible in terms of their, they give an illusion of control because it's all centralized, but centralization is just illusory in terms of its control. Everyone then keeps their local copy and it starts to get out of date. 
project management in banks is a problem. Ability to change in banks because of the way they're organized. They're, they're, uh, they're highly functional organizations. Huge issues with legacy architectures. So probably if you were about to go from here and set up uh, an equivalent of data art, the way that you could get the biggest potential revenue would be to re-engineer legacy architectures. The legacy architectures in a bank or insurance company, typically there will be massive duplication and massive redundancy. They will have, I know a small bank that has 12 separate uh, risk systems. And then they have a department of 100 people who spend all day every day trying to reconcile the differences between the risk systems so that they end up with the least wrong answer. They can never have the right answer. They can only ever get the least wrong answer. Um, and it's because legacy architectures, if you think about it back in the 90s, um, organizations were siloed, so they all built their own systems because uh, they had so much money. The, the profits for banking were huge. Everything was built inside their own business unit. And then in the 2000s, we started to try and integrate this stuff together, and we just jammed it together. It wasn't designed to be integrated. Nobody really understood how to do, well, we didn't have web services. Uh, nobody really understood how to do service-oriented architectures. People tried to do it. People tried to jam stuff together. What they ended up with was legacy architectures where nobody knows how it works. And they're scared to pull the plug out in case everything stops working. And sometimes they pull the plug out and nothing stops working, which is a bit weird because they think, well, I thought that plug attached to that system. Why is it all still working? It, it, it's incredible. Um, the, a typical bank will spend nearly 50% of all of its uh, operating budget on its IT, mainly on supporting its IT. Um, so if you want to make yourself very rich, ask for uh, a share of the amount of money you save by re-engineering their legacy architectures. And uh, Andrew is a big proponent, as I am, of don't actually touch the legacy systems, just build layers above them so that everything can talk to everything. But he'll talk about that in a minute. The cost of IT I've mentioned, risk management, digitalization. The problem with banks have now is that we're all used to using things like Uber. Okay. And for that, us, us, for us, that's, that's usual. Um, sorry. It's, we're all used to using mobile apps. And, and so now when we use a banking system, and Andrew and I were looking at actually the best online banking system in Ukraine, and it's horrible. You know, it's super clunky. You're clicking between web pages. There's no feeling of it being an app. Uh, but people are getting used to using apps. And then when they go to their bank, they're thinking, this is, this is rubbish. Um, so, that, you know, and so people are losing confidence in them. Outsourcing. Uh, banks, to reduce their costs, needs to outsource, but they're not very good at doing it. They have skills gaps. Uh, banking, since the, the, uh, the crash, has become rather an unpopular destination for very good engineers, so people won't join the banks. They will join the outsource companies that fix everything, but they won't join the actual bank. And then we have these huge issues around regulation, compliance, and reporting. There was a period over the last few years where the m there were more projects driven by compliance and regulation, MIFID II, Dodd-Frank, and all the rest of it, than anything else. <coughs> So I'm going to run out of time if I uh, carry on um, uh, speaking at this speed. So I won't read the words, but just to say, what do we do? So we build new software products and services, uh, and that's important. You know, we do actually build a lot of new stuff for our clients, stuff they don't have now, stuff that their clients don't have now, um, and, and we like that. We do modernize and enhance existing solutions. We do re-engineer legacy enterprise architectures, though I confess we typically try to persuade them to put you know, web services layers and so on above it rather than put enormous, uh, s a slow decommissioning of the legacy, but actually try and get a rapid movement of improvement um, in the ability to use the data from legacy systems. Um, we do introduce new ways of working at a process and tool level. Um, we do provide expert inputs and resources on a just-in-time basis. So people will call it, we don't do body shopping, but people will call us up and say, well, especially existing clients, and say, do you have an expert in X? And it's amazing, at data art, we seem to have an expert in everything somewhere, even if we didn't know it. We just put an email out and somebody says, actually, I used to use that. And uh, oh, I don't know what that's supposed to say, helping to control the cost and effort of managing existing, I'm going to guess that systems. Uh, we do know how to run systems very well. Um, there's another slide. I don't know if you actually get the slides from these presentations. Hopefully you do, and then you can get to read it. Um, I'll just read the product development one. So 
we have uh, industry practices, as I mentioned, finance being one of them, and uh, we do try and collect a lot of domain expertise, but people shouldn't let that put them off joining data art, because what we say is actually working on our clients' projects, you will learn a lot. So, um, you know, typically in, in uh, Eastern Europe and Russia, we don't tend to find people with a lot of banking experience um, or trading experience, uh, though, you know, commodity trading, uh, perhaps, and then they can pick it up in finance extremely easily. Uh, but people do learn the domain very quickly. Um, we do do a lot of B2B, B2C and enterprise startups. There are private equity firms who come to us uh, uh, or recommend us to their investments and say, you should use data art to build this. And these are important ones. I'm not talking about little things. I'm talking about global solutions for things like banking settlements and reconciliations uh, worldwide. <laughs> um, we are extremely keen, uh, and I am, but uh, one of the reasons we got married was that uh, data art is as well. I am very keen on getting rid of the waterfall problem. Waterfall actually does work extremely well in certain situations, uh, but when banks use waterfall, they store a lot of risk. So they spend months writing the requirements in isolation from their customers, not talking to their customers. Then they do design, not talking to anyone. Then they do build, not talking to anyone. Then they do test, and then eventually it gets released at some point. Somebody says, what's this? I don't want this. So what we do is we get rid of all of that risk that was stored up, and we say, what's your idea? And they tell us, and we say, who have you told? Well, we've discussed it inside. Well, that's no good. And we go out with them to potential customers, whether it's B2B or B2C, and we say, show them your idea. And they say, oh, that's quite interesting, but you need to change that and that and that. And they go back and they change their idea. And then we go back to a bigger group and we say, what do you think of this idea? Well, that's quite interesting, but you need to change that one thing. So we go away and we change that one thing. And then we build a prototype or a proof of concept. And then we show it to a bigger group. And they go, oh, because you guys, if you're all engineers, will know that as soon as you show something to someone, suddenly they remember all the things they forgot to tell you. So <laughs> and then they go, oh, that's great. But I've remembered another 20 things, you think. Mm. Um, and then you put the 20 things in. And you don't throw your prototype away. You just iterate, 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 minimum viable product, and you release it. And then there's a wide customer base using the MVP, release one. You get lots of feedback, and then you continue building the product. Uh, we're very, very keen on that. And actually, we get a lot of business, especially from banks, because of that iterative approach to development. Because um, somebody said to me recently, why don't banks get it? And I said, they do. You'll be surprised. When we speak to them, they know that the way they do it doesn't work. But they've been very constrained by not knowing how to do it different and also the way they're organized. So they get us to help them. Um, system modernization, I won't go through all the bits. Technology consulting, on-demand IT, and ma we do do managed support. Uh, we don't do a huge amount, but it's, 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 it, it, we do more of it increasingly because people want it. If you build good solutions and you're in partnership, they will ask you to run stuff. And here's the other thing. I predicted when I first met Data Art that they would be asked to do out full outsource, take over the whole IT department, and that has happened. And I said, it won't matter whether you want to do it or not, your clients will decide. And that's happened. So. Why clients use us? Um, we've worked across pretty much every area of finance. So sorry for all the words. I'm not going to read them. Um, and so we, ha we do have, a, you know, we have experience. When people come to us and say, you know, we want to do settlements reconciliation, they go, okay, we've done that. But we want it done by blockchain. And we go, we've done that. People go, wow, really? I go, yes. There's a lot of consultancies in the world, I won't name them because I'm being recorded and they'll uh, come and kill me, who are doing lots of conferences and presentations on their blockchain expertise. But we've actually done two, and they're live in the market, two very important blockchain-related projects. And I'm not talking for f small fintech startups. I'm talking for uh, one of the world's uh, best known financial organizations and one large government and it's a financial product for that government. Um, so we actually do blockchain and as soon as people know you do blockchain, actually really do it, not just talk about it, they're all beating your door down. Um, we and if, uh, if anyone knows blockchain, come and see me later. 
because we do struggle to handle the business. <laughs> um, we do work from the front office to the middle office to the back office. You'll tend to find uh, often that IT consultancies will emphasize one part rather than the other part, and that's fine. But you see, if you think about it, we argue for a holistic approach to development. So we're actually arguing to make the whole thing better. So if we just concentrated on front office or middle office or back office, that would be kind of counter to what we're trying to argue for, which is let's look at the whole value chain. Um, and the breadth and depth of our technical expertise is second to none. As I said earlier, though there's only 2,000 of us, we do seem to have somebody who's an expert on everything, and uh, we never run out. So clients use us because uh, we do have a good attitude. So the thing about data art, and it is important in financial services, um, some of our competitors are good. They are very good engineers, but their, their business model is to make as much money as they can out of their clients. And that becomes rather transparent. Our business model is we like working here. Um, and we always have to like working here. And we want our clients to be as successful as they possibly can be. And what we find is then the money comes anyway and the business comes because we care a lot and it, it does it does it really works um, we in the finance practice we do almost no real selling so we do do a lot of networking because we like meeting people uh, but a lot of people come to meet us and um, so you know we don't have to do cold calling and all that sort of stuff uh, and what we find is that our clients hang on to us so we stay um, if one of them leaves the next place they go to they recommend us and also, everyone knows everyone in the city of London, so people recommend us to the people they know in other organizations, and it keeps on growing. We don't really do selling in the traditional sense. We don't have to. We're very lucky. Um, so we use what's called a solution design approach. So we, 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 uh, we tend to say, we're not going to give you a single solution to this problem. We're going to give you a range of options. You can fix it this way for a million pounds, in six months and you can fix it in this way for 10 million pounds in three years and if I was you I would take the cheaper one because actually you probably don't need all of that or and this is quite common build this one first get something out and then work on this one in parallel so we uh, we try not to just solutionize all the time we try and give them a range of options um, we do have engineering excellent we invest in our people a lot we train people you know anyone wants to do any different job in data art they get to do it um, and we're reliable. Um, so this is the slide I said was um, I'd probably throw away because the banks and the exchanges, ratings agencies, many of the hedge funds don't want their names on here. Um, I must ask them one day. I think part of it is that they're worried that um, if it's known that we're helping them and then they release a great product, people work it out that, that we built it and then they'll come to us and you know the IP will start to drift away. Who knows? Um, but that's some of them. Collar Capital, Monex Europe, very well known, Apex Fund Services, Bematech, BNP Paribas, of course, very big bank, but we have lots of other banks. Then I put some case studies on, uh, not going to get time to show you them, uh, so I'm going to run through them very quickly and not explain them. Bematech is absolutely market dominant in point of sale technology in places like the US, well the Americas, I'd say the Americas, South America, North America, and um, point of sale technology in the world, and you know this from being a customer, has always been rather hardware dependent. It's just locked into, they actually give a terminal to the retailer. They give the handheld device to the restaurants. It's always come with its own hardware. What we've done is we've taken their fantastic products and services and stuck them on cloud-based solutions so that people, and made it a subscription service so that people can just, you know, run on the tablets, run on their phones, not be, you know, having to buy hardware and wait for it to arrive and all that sort of stuff and install it and run it on PCs or servers. Uh, so we've made that cloud-based. They're an amazing company. Um, Real-time time trading simulator. There's lots of traders in the world. Uh, they need to be trained. Uh, so we, and this company was successful um, already, uh, teaching people how to trade. And when I say people, I'm not just talking about retail investors. I'm talking about institutions, large banks wanted to train new traders. Uh, they were already successful, but we um, absolutely transformed their their uh, their tools. Personal loans application. We do a lot of uh, banking digitalization projects now, so we are massively re-engineering the processes for um, 
loans in banks around the world, North America, the UK, and mainland Europe. And uh, we're digitalizing it as well. So, you know, it's all app-based as well. But we're also, we're also completely re-engineering the back-end processes. So this is the sort of stuff that, you know, it should have been designed like this all along, really. Uh, it's the way that we like to work as customers. Risk and analysis platforms, so some of these are quite technical, which some of you will love. Um, risk is the huge issue in <laughs> capital markets especially, and we've had all sorts of new laws and regulations as a result of the financial collapse. Um, and uh, you know, risk analysis. The world would like to move to real-time risk analysis. That would be the nirvana. Will it ever be achieved? I don't know. But if at least banks could have a true and accurate position of their risk or hedge funds uh, on a daily basis that they could trust, then they would be a hundred times happier. And uh, so our tools are trying to help them do that. But there's a lot of data management issues sit behind this. So you can't just build a tool and it's fixed. Uh, you have to do massive data management projects. Uh, a price reporting platform. Um, uh, a sell side trading platform. We, we uh, actually, and uh, some of these, I, I should write up some new case studies. So we just finished another algo trading project um, in the Middle East, actually, for a bank in the Middle East. Uh, so that's uh, relatively automated, uh, though they, they could choose to have it semi-automated um, uh, trading solution. Not this one, but you can see some of the uh, technologies we use there. See the screens. Matching counterparties by price, display, volume, and time priority, supporting person-to-person -person negotiations through IM, central settlement counterparty supporting the trade execution, fixed integration to manage large quantities of data, real-time data provider integration, and highly responsive GUI. Um, actually, some of our big data, we do have a big data practice, um, but uh, I anticipate that about half of their work will be helping us because some of the solutions we build are handling many millions of trades or prices or transactions per day. Um, so sorry I had to blast through them, but don't hold us up. Uh, why do people work for us? Well, it's great. It's really interesting, you know, and we train people a lot and we don't micromanage people. And, you know, we like to make sure that people get to work on the stuff that they like working on because that's how you get the best out of people. Everyone likes certain aspects of their job more than other aspects. And we try to let them do that. And they get to travel a lot, meet interesting people. Bankers are much more interesting than people realize, I promise. Here we are, 2,000 consultants and engineers, etc., And 95% return clients. So in reality, our clients tend to hang on to us forever, which is good. <laughs>